The first night shooting with the SQA 106 is done. The five things that I learned from it right after the trailer. Hey, this is View Into Space. I'm Sascha from Switzerland. So good to meet you under and thanks for watching my channel. Testing a telescope of this price range and this quality is something that has to be taken very seriously. Because if I make a recommendation, I want to be sure that it's the right one. But I had the first night of shooting, I stacked a picture from it, I took flats, I installed an EAF. And so based on my first impressions, I want to give you my five takeaways. But I have a lot more questions and things I want to check out. So for the next week or so, there's rain and clouds here in Switzerland, but as soon as I have some clear skies again, I will continue my testing and there will be a follow-up video. But let's start now with the five things I can tell you right now. And the first one goes hand in hand with what I told you already in my first video. The handle. Thank God I ordered it right when I discovered that this is needed. And quite honestly, I don't know what I would have done without it. This telescope is so heavy that putting it safely on the mount without having a safe grip here would be an extremely risky endeavor I would not even dare to do. So I just want to reinforce my recommendation from video one. If you order this scope, by all means also order the handle. Spending 60 bucks more on the handle is still much better than having a $3,000 scope lying on the floor shattered. And with that, let's come to number two, which is mainly a lesson learned. You know how I mentioned that it's so easy with the Petzval design. Simply attach your camera back here. Nothing can go wrong. You might laugh about it, but there is actually, even with Petzval design, a too close. Obviously, if you read the manual, you figure that out. I learned it the hard way, simply that I could not get the, the scope in focus. So you need to be at least 48 millimeters away to be able to put it in focus. The range is from 48 millimeters to 78 millimeters. That's no problem when you know it. Now you know it, but it can easily be overseen. Number three is a little bit specific to this combination, an eight kilogram scope on the AM5. And in this example here, guiding, I got a guiding RMS from 0.35 to 0.45 without anything fancy, just default setting of the ASI air. And I found that pretty amazing. So if you ever wonder if a scope of this class would be too heavy for your AM5, it definitely isn't. It performs beautifully on it. For the last two points, we will go to my computer. So this is the test image I shot two nights ago. First of all, it was shot with a 2600 MC Air, so a one-shot color camera with a Andrea quad band filter. It's about three hours of integration time. And all I've done is gradient correction. Nothing else, it's not stretched, no exterminators whatsoever. This is as it is. There's one thing else that I think is crucial to say here, that it was almost full moon. And this has its impacts. That's also why I will only comment two things at the moment. For the rest, I need further testing under <laughs> better conditions. But by the way, it's actually a nice region here with the Galaxy M108 and the Owl Nebula, so a planetary nebula. So it has a little bit of everything. So first takeaway is noise. So three hours of integration time, let's zoom in. This is now on a one by two basis. And as you can see, there is really not much noise. And I think this is really crucial because when we talk about this scope, it's always about pinpoint stars. 
But what I realized is that, especially probably in a time with BXT and whatever, the question is how important are pinpoint stars even? And we will come to that question in one of the follow-up videos, because that's a question I always wanted to know. But from my point of view, being a full f-stop faster than a comparable cheaper scope, so getting twice as much data can probably have the bigger impact, especially if you live in a region like here in Switzerland, where every hour of clear sky is precious. And yes, obviously you could go with a Rasa, which brings a million of other problems, but here on a refractive basis and on a high precision refractive basis, you also have the very fast f-stop and still not as fast that you get into other issues again, like special filters, yada, yada. So, so that's something that really only really crossed my mind once I first looked at this picture. But let's now still talk about the pinpoint stars. And thankfully here in PixInside we have the Aberration Inspector, but let's now dive even on a one-on-one -on -one basis into it. So here we are now. Let's go to the upper left corner. And I think what you nicely see is that all these stars are absolutely perfectly round. This is not full frame, it's only APS-C. That's as good as it gets what I have. I don't have a full frame sensor. But when I look also here at the stars, also here, they're perfectly round up to the outer corners. I never really doubted that. I would hope that a scope of this price range can deliver that. But if we needed any last confirmation, I can give it to you now. It delivers absolutely round stars throughout the picture. And by the way, if you just want to look here at the galaxy, from that, that we are actually here on a one-on-one -on -one basis and a one-shot color camera, that's quite a lot of details. So from a first very rough testing point of view, there is nothing I could tell you that speaks against this scope. So I know this was still very basic, but as promised, more serious result also needs more serious testing, needs more clear skies. It will come in time, but I just wanted to already provide to you what I know right now. I hope it was helpful. See you next time. Clear skies.